Excellent. Uh, I'm going to cover four points in four minutes, so I'm going to go fast. We're going to start off with, uh, I want to thank you for inviting me to participate uh, in this debate and for being open-minded. I think there's not enough open-mindedness out there these days. Uh, point number two, climate change is, is a legitimate problem. So I can lay out the science uh, pretty simply and quickly. Let's start off with this fact that carbon concentrations in the atmosphere are going up. Nobody doubts that this is primarily due to human activity, burning fossil fuels, and deforestation. Then we have this theory that says that if carbon concentrations in the atmosphere go up, then global temperatures are going to go up. This theory goes back uh, more than 100 years to this fellow Arrhenius, who's a chemist in Sweden in 1896. So for the last 150 years or so, we have been running this experiment on planet Earth, and here are the results of the experiment. The blue dots here are measures of global average temperatures for individual years. The red bars are 10-year averages, starting from the 1880s and going up to the 1970s. And then here's the 1980s, here's the 1990s, here's the 2000s, here's the first part of this decade. Temperatures, I would argue, going up pretty much in line with the projections of climate science. So that's point number two, climate change is a legitimate problem. Point number three here is that there are conservative solutions to this problem. I would love to talk to you about the American Conservative Coalition, group formed by current college students and recent alums. I would love to talk to you about the Conservative Energy Network. I would love to talk to you about R Street, which split off from the Heartland Institute because they uh, want to engage on climate issues. I'd love to talk to you about Students for Carbon Dividends, a relatively new group that includes a chapter of the Carl College Republicans here at the University of Minnesota. Love talking about republicen.org, started by former six-term Republican South Carolina Congressman Bob Inglis. But I'm not going to have time to talk to you about that in my opening remarks. <laughs> I would love to be able to talk to you about the ballot measure that I worked on in Washington State. Carbon tax, revenue mutual carbon tax ballot measure endorsed by one of the leading Republicans in Washington State, Rob McKenna, who wrote this in his endorsement for Initiative 732. He wrote, any ballot measure that the Sierra Club despises is worth considering. I would love to tell you more about that. I can't do that in my opening remarks. I'd love to talk about this op-ed that appeared in the New York Times last week, authored by the former CEO of State Farm, about how we should take climate change seriously. I can't do that. I'm not going to have time in my opening remarks. Why not? Because I have to get to point number four, which relates to the fact that Mark Murano doesn't believe in basic climate science. Right, so his book actually shows that climate facts are twisted, including by him. And I want to give you some examples. Here's this temperature data from the Trump administration, right, from NOAA. Mark Morano doesn't like this particular data set. Here's what he writes about in his book. He said, oh, we shouldn't take service data. We should go with the satellite data. All right, so fine, let's look at the satellite data, which started in 1979. What does Mark Morano say about this in his book? He says, global temperatures have been essentially steady, holding basically steady, higher temperatures than I predicted haven't actually materialized. If you look at the data, the satellite data since 1979, this is gonna blow your mind. Here's what it looks like. Temperatures since 1979, if you do a statistical analysis of this, of all 38 data points, you get that trend line. Or, if you don't want to do a statistical analysis of all 38 data points, you can do what Mark does, which is to do a statistical analysis of just two data points and conclude that temperatures for 2016 are statistically indistinguishable from 1998. That's not the right way to do statistics. You want another example? Let's take sea ice. So this is Arctic sea ice. It goes up and down over the course of the year. There's a, a low point in late summer, right, right around now. Here's basically the average for the 1980s. Here's the average for the 1990s. Here's the average for the 2000s. The average for the decade we're in right now is roughly in line with what you see for 2016, but there was a low in 2012. Okay, what does Mark say about this in his book? He says, oh, Arctic sea ice was 22% greater in 2016, the red line, than it was in 2012. That's not a very reasonable way of presenting this data. Right, so Mark's book is called The Politically Incorrect Guide to Climate Change, but it would really be much better if it was just called The Incorrect Guide to Climate Change. Right, let's take another example. He talks about me in the book. He says I'm a professor at Florida State University. I've never even been to Tallahassee. <laughs> <laughs> Not good. Okay? 
So there's really a fundamental question here about who you should believe, and the answer is that you should believe me. Right, whose book should you buy? You should buy my book. Mark's book has very few graphs in it. In fact, I brought my copy of Mark's book, and I want to show you what happens if you get rid of all of the pages that don't have graphs in it. There's five graphs in the whole book. It's a 400 page, the li how am I gonna explain this to the library? <laughs> There's five graphs in the whole book, and you know what? This morning, Mark acknowledged that one of those graphs is wrong. You know what that means? 20% of the graphs in his book are wrong. Well, like Mark likes to bring up in his book that Arrhenius, the fellow who uh, did some of the early work on climate science in 1896. He says, look, Arrhenius also recommended that we could improve primary education by electrocuting school children. That's called comic relief in the book. Right? <laughs> now, maybe that's true. I think that was a good story. Right? Uh, but you know what? Isaac Newton spent a considerable portion of his life trying to turn lead into gold. Right? That doesn't mean that gravity doesn't work. I understand some stuff about the scientific method. And the scientific method is really about whether you can predict the future. Okay? Now, the most amazing scientific experiment I've ever heard of is something called the spot of Arago. Okay, you can Google this. This was when they were talking about like, is light a particle or is light a wave? And the folks who thought the light was a particle wanted to make fun of the folks who thought the light was a wave. So they showed mathematically that if you took a light and, sh and you shine the light at a, like a bowling ball, right, that part of the light, if light was really a wave, part of the light would look like it was passing through the middle of the bowling ball. Right, and you could see this spot on the other side. That was what the scientific prediction was if light actually acted like a wave. Right? And you know what? It's true. It's true. Right? So science is about trying to predict the future. And the thing that Mark doesn't want to talk about is the thing that I want to focus on, which is that climate scientists have been predicting for decades that temperatures are going to increase. And in fact, temperatures have increased. That's it. That's the end of the story. It's not about my book. That's not having predictions. What is it with predictions? Is that, is that just the economist in you? I don't have you to make that's how you no decide. Decide. No, you know, you know, Mark deals with this because he's obsessed with the past and he's sort of locked into this 1980s mentality. Right, where like Billy really Idol was on the radio, and we didn't have good enough data from the current period to see whether or not temperatures were going to increase. But you know what? We've got more data now. And the data from his buddy Roy Spencer, that was the data I showed you on the screen, the data from his buddy Roy Spencer says the temperatures have in fact been increasing. Look at, I'm just look at the graph. Some ideas, but you can't cite one IPCC report and say, oh, it says this. Go back to the original. It shows the medieval warm period warmer, and then you hear scientists say we have to get rid of that, and by 2001, presto, they erased the medieval warm period. 50 temperatures have not increased by since the medieval warm period. They, they had to get rid of the medieval warm period because that was their talking point in logic history, and you go back to the Roman warming, the medieval warming, and I'm not obsessed with the medieval warm period, and I'm not obsessed with the medieval warm period, and I'm not obsessed with the medieval warm period. 20 years from now, Mark Morano is going to be on a stage talking about the medieval warm period. And the rest of us are going to say, hey, what have temperatures done for the last 20 years? Nothing. Wait a second. Nothing that happens in the next 20 years could convince Mark that climate change is something that we should be thinking seriously about because nothing in the last 20 years has convinced Mark that climate change is something we should be thinking seriously about. So this debate is really not about changing minds up here on the stage. This debate is about the minds of those of you who are in the audience. Right, and the question is, look, when you look at the data, right, when you look at that, do you see something where temperatures are increasing? And if so, then let's go on and talk about the next topic, which is, well, it, you know, how big of a problem is this? And is there something reasonable that we can do about it? And the case that I would make is that it's a problem that we should take seriously and that there's something reasonable that we can do about it. Now, what can we do about it? We can say, like the policy I worked on in Washington State, let's have a carbon tax and let's use the revenue from the carbon tax to cut other taxes. Defending. And I still like my book picked up. That is 
Disrespect. <laughs> I didn't do it to your Hey, this is Yoram. You can get more of my comedy videos and information about climate change on my website, StandUpEconomist.com. Follow me on Twitter, at StandUpEcon, and I hope you'll consider hiring me for a comedy show or for another debate with Mark Morano. I just want to say I'm totally going to put this book back together.